Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Did you know we have a second channel called Generation Films where we basically do the same thing we do on this channel but covering a wider range of movies. We recently did a video about some of the best battlefield strategies used in science fiction movies. We naturally had to do a segment on Thrawn here and his terrific command strategy during the destruction of Special Task Force 1. He had a tiny patrol force going up against a giant Trade Federation armada. Using his uncanny ability to analyze the enemy, he quickly found their weakness and destroyed most of their fleet. But that was just the beginning of what and who Thrawn would one day become. He was just a young commander in the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet at the time. His most famous victories and triumphs had yet to come. But things do get a bit complicated. In the new Disney canon, Thrawn's career is abruptly ended before even the Battle of Yavin kicks off. We're not really sure if he's alive or not still, but he's definitely out of the picture for now, and most likely stranded with a bunch of space whales on the Outer Rim. In Legends, however, Thrawn plays a much larger role in the Empire and the Galaxy after the Battle of Endor. Instead of just ending abruptly a year after Endor at the Battle of Jakku, the Galactic Civil War in Legends drags on a bit longer, with various warlords and former leaders trying to unsuccessfully unite the galaxy. During this turbulent time after the Emperor's death, Thrawn was actually situated in the Unknown Region, working on a side project known as the Empire of Hand. This is a new faction that Thrawn started with the blessing of the Emperor, and its sole purpose was to protect the galaxy from external threats that might arrive in the Unknown Region, aka the Far Outsiders, or Yu Zhang Vong that Palpatine scouts had detected. In Legends, the Yu Zhang Vong are the big band that arrives 30 years after the original trilogy, and in my opinion, they were a lot more interesting than the First Order and a lot more dangerous for the entire galaxy. Now, because Thrawn managed to stay out of the Empire during this very turbulent time, and he actually avoided a lot of the political maneuvering and assassinations and other nonsense he didn't really have time for. He was too busy fighting against terrifying aliens in the Unknown Region. Eight years after the Battle of Yavin and four years after the Battle of Endor, the Empire had lost almost 75% of its territory, including most of its territory in the Deep Core. By this time, Thrawn had finally stabilized his territory in the Unknown Region, and he decides to return to the Empire. You see, Thrawn too was very concerned with the Yu Zhang Vong. He had fought them during his time in the Chiss Expansionary Defense Force, and they proved to be incredibly difficult to defeat, even for him. Thrawn ultimately realized that the Chiss were too small to stand alone against such a massive threat, and the Empire, with its military first orientation, was the only chance the galaxy had for survival. And four years after the Battle of Endor, the New Republic was proving to be just as corrupt, inefficient, and politically gridlocked as the Old Republic. Thrawn knew that with them in charge of the galaxy, billions if not trillions of lives will be lost when the Yu Zing Vong arrive. He's kind of right about that, but right now during this conflict, the New Republic and Thrawn's own Imperial forces are both in very bad shape. The destruction of Quat shipyards had to really cut back the amount of capital ships being produced in the core region, and now both sides were heavily focused on capturing enemy ships to kind of replace their losses. Mon Mothma and the New Republic did have one thing going for them, though. They now controlled most of the economic and population centers in the galaxy, whereas Imperial space was far less developed. Mon Mothma decided to withdraw the New Republic from offensive positions and put them into more defendable positions. This way, the Republic could refit its navy. She would let the New Republic's robust economic system defeat the Empire instead. Since the death of the Emperor and the loss of the Core Worlds, the Imperial Remnant has struggled to maintain its large and expensive fleet of Star Destroyers. Nine years after the Battle of Yob and Grand Admiral Thrawn would unite and consolidate the remaining Imperial forces underneath his command. Aboard his flagship, the Chimera, with his second-in-command, Captain Gilead Pelion, Thrawn would wage a devastating campaign against the New Republic. Now, Thrawn's forces were greatly outnumbered by the New Republic. He wasn't really able to carry out a galactic-wide assault with multiple fronts. But what he did have was what remained of Death Squadron. Formerly under the command of Darth Vader, Death Squadron was made up of 12 Imperial-class Star Destroyers. With these 12 ships, Thrawn would approach dismantling the New Republic in the same way he usually approached battle, with very careful analysis and planning. He began testing the New Republic forces' response times of raids and probes in bordering systems. Now, Thrawn would eventually scale up his attacks and carry out full-on raids on Republic worlds, mimicking the strategy that the Rebel Alliance had used years earlier, hit-and-run tactics. Now, Thrawn's main goal here was to actually grow his navy to a much larger size and at the same time keep the New Republic off balance. 
Roughly half a century earlier, an entire fleet of Dreadnought class heavy cruisers were lost in hyperspace when a highly infectious virus spread throughout the entire fleet. It was believed that whoever gained control over these 200 ships would also be able to win the war. And that's exactly what Thrawn goes after. He reaches the Dreadnought cruisers before the New Republic does. Thrawn was probably appreciating the irony of the situation now. The New Republic, which had been born out of the Rebellion, was now forced to adopt the same defensive strategies that the Empire had used against them. They had to create fortress worlds, which had to be reinforced by quick reaction fleets from nearby sectors. Meanwhile, Thrawn was free to attack whatever system he wanted, keeping the Republic on their toes. His ultimate goal was to take Coruscant, the political, cultural, and economic heart of the galaxy and the New Republic. After taking several horrendous defeats at the hands of Thrawn, the New Republic's legitimacy was now being questioned. And after capturing the world of Ord Mantel, Thrawn launches a feint at the planet of Merst in order to draw the Coruscant Sector fleet away. Although this tactic did work, Coruscant was still defended by a very robust orbital defense platform system. Garm Bell Ibis also was in command of the Coruscant home fleet. But Thrawn had a way around this. You see, he loved collecting military technology. That was kind of his hobby when he wasn't perfecting his command skills or researching how to utterly destroy his enemies in the most intimate way possible. One of the technologies that he embraced fully was the Interdictor Cruiser. These were large capital ships equipped with powerful gravity well generators. Now, most Imperial captains would use these interdictors to pull enemy ships out of hyperspace and then prevent them from escaping. Now, these ships were great for anti-smuggling and anti-piracy missions, along with trapping rubble cells so that they can escape. But Thrawn found an offensive use for these ships as well. Interdictors were great at pulling off what's known as a micro jump. Micro jumps are short range jumps that one might expect to use in a dense cluster or gravitational anomalies. But in combat, it can be a brilliant way to bring in reinforcements or outflank your enemy by using hyperspace jumps. It's actually a very crazy and difficult method to pull off. And that's because normally these jumps are quite hard to calculate. But by using an interdictor, Thrawn could pinpoint exactly where he wants his reinforcements to arrive thanks to its gravity well generators. During the Siege of Coruscant, this would be one of the methods that Thrawn would use to surprise the defenders. Thrawn began the battle by jumping out of hyperspace with a fleet of 10 interdictors and 8 Katana dreadnoughts along with 6 Imperial class Star Destroyers. This would have been an impressive sight over most systems, but over Coruscant, which usually had hundreds of ships defending it, it's not really that big of a deal. On the New Republic side, you had Admiral Hiram Drayson, who was in charge of the Home Guard fleet and its Golan 3 Space Defense Nova Gun. These were going to be a huge problem for Thrawn. The space stations were larger and better armed than an Imperial class Star Destroyer and also had tougher shields. With more than 50 turbo lasers on board, the Golan station could dish out a lot of damage before a ship could even reach firing range. And so before the New Republic commanders knew what was going on, Thrawn has two Victory class Star Destroyers jump right alongside one of the Golan platforms, completely surprising the defenders on board. Now, Thrawn knew that the Gold Line 3 stations were incredibly durable, and most likely his Victory Class Star Destroyers would not be able to take them out. Garm Bell Ibis knew as well, but he wasn't really in charge of the defense of Coruscant just yet. But Admiral Drayson was soon relieved because he was incompetent, and Garm Bell Ibis takes command instead, and instead of trying to engage Thrawn's fleet, Ibis has his ships retreat. This is a really good strategy by Garm Bell Ibis because it forces Thrawn to make one of two choices, either stay in orbit and try to destroy the Golan platforms, which were really doing a lot of damage by now, or pursue the New Republic home fleet down to the surface where, where Thrawn will probably expose his ships to ground fire. Thrawn, of course, does neither. He reveals another secret weapon he's collected throughout his journey, a hybridium cloaking device. These very rare machines could make any object invisible to the naked eye and even scanners. Prior to the siege, of course, on Thrawn would cloak ships and have them infiltrate New Republic worlds secretly before an actual invasion. So when the New Republic world turned on their planetary shields in preparation for attack, there were already cloaked ships hiding beneath the planetary shield. So when the rest of Thrawn's navy appeared over the shield and started firing down at the shield, the cloaked ships would also line up their shots so it looked like the turbo laser bolts were going through the planetary shield. This is oftentimes enough to terrify the New Republic defenders and oftentimes led to surrender happening without any shots even being fired. This time around though, Thrawn uses the cloaking devices to hide several large asteroids, which he puts into orbit over the planets. Although Thrawn only has around 20 of these devices, he keeps on pretending to launch devices and the New Republic has no idea what he's doing or how many devices he's launching into the atmosphere. Soon, one of the first cloaked asteroids strikes the escort frigate Ivanru and heavily damages it. 
That one collision is basically all Thrawn needed. He would take his entire fleet and retreat from the system so he can go engage the New Republic in other sectors. Thrawn was a smart military strategist. He knew that Coruscant was almost impossible to take by force, and even if you could, the destruction amount of casualties that would happen as a result would be astronomical. And so his goal was to embarrass the New Republic, show how incompetent their leaders were, and hopefully win some admiration from the New Republic citizens. Maybe one day they'll adopt the Imperial way. The second and more important goal is to keep all the defenders trapped on Coruscant so they can't go relieve other fleets in other sectors. You see, the fear of these invisible asteroids flying over Coruscant was a huge problem. No one really knew how many there were or where they were, so they couldn't really take out the planetary shield just yet because they were afraid that these invisible asteroids might crash into Coruscant, which was a planet-wide city. And so with the planetary shield closed, Coruscant was essentially blockading itself. No ships could arrive and no ships could leave. And so Coruscant would remain out of commission. It would be blockaded and locked down for several months, or at least until the New Republic figured out how to find these invisible flying asteroids. It was a brilliant move, and Thrawn didn't even need to keep a fleet above the planet to blockade it. Simply brilliant. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our content. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.